Glass here coming to you in the land of Corona, which I now call it, where Zoom is allowed and I can meet whoever I want. And so because of that, I am allowed to meet a maker in, I think you're in California, is that right? No, I'm in Washington State. <laughs> there you go. Seattle. <laughs> there you go. I'm wrong already. So please introduce yourself. So I'm Charan Sachar and I'm the potter and fiber artist behind Creative with Clay. And I'm essentially mostly a potter, but I think deep within my veins, I am a fiber artist. So a lot of my work has always been inspired by fiber and fabric, but essentially I'm a potter, I think. I no, think. I don't know, fiber artist. <laughs> I, think, I think I decided you were in California because I saw a lot of photos of Stitches West in your feed. Yes, so uh, that is one of the biggest shows I do. Uh, Stitches West and uh, what was earlier Madrona in um, uh, Tacoma, Washington. I'm very close to Tacoma, Washington. So, and now it's called Red Order. So I, that is a big show and Stitches West. So I'm glad those two shows happened early in the year. So that is what all the pictures are probably from. <laughs> Exactly. So you mentioned that you're a potter, but you are also a fiber artist. So tell us your creative story. How did you get to be a potter and a fiber artist? Um, I started off, I always was interested in, you know, doing stuff with my hands. And, but being raised in an Indian family, the focus was a lot on education. So I actually came to the U.S. to do my master's in computer science. And uh, I did that. And I was pretty good at it too. I got my 4.0 GPA, got my job at Intel. Uh, that's what brought me to Washington State. And uh, I worked in the IT industry for 11 years. Uh, but as soon as I came to Washington because of my job, uh, that's when I really got my weekends free because I wasn't studying all the time like I always was. And uh, so that's the reason why I then picked up pottery, which I really wanted to do. I wanted to work with clay. I wanted to work with my hands. And that is what kind of got things started. So that was around in 2000. Did you take so, a class or are you self-taught? Uh, mostly self-taught. I did take a few classes within, I think like the six week class session right after that i started teaching at the same place itself because i was short of teachers and i had not done much in clay uh, but i picked it up very quickly and i spent every evening out there even though we had restricted hours i kind of you know butted up the instructors and said that hey come on please <laughs> i have nothing to do in the evenings i was single i had you know uh, i was working during the day and uh, this was a good creative outlet for me and so that was kind of where my clay journey started. And then the fiber journey is, it's actually always been in my background because my mom's side of the family has been in the, you know, in the Indian fabric business, uh, embroidery, printing. And my mom even started a shop in the 90s. Uh, she had her own boutique. She used to design uh, clothes for brides and bridesmaids. So there's a lot of that color and fabric and texture influence which was there. So it has been, but I actively never did anything with fiber. I helped her in the shop and she wanted me to join the business and stuff, but I was like, not for me, too many bridezillas in India, so. Too many what, brides what? Bridezillas. Oh, bridezillas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everywhere, not just here. <laughs> Now talk about bridezillas in India. Now in India, and I'm not very educated on this, but are, are marriages still arranged marriages in India? Uh, there are several. Have you seen the latest Netflix show? No. Okay, it's Indian Matrimonials, which is a reality cringe television almost, but it is based on an Indian matchmaker who finds arranged marriages for suitors and most of the suitors are in the US but they are Indian origin and they are looking for a bride or a groom 
and she's basically matching them up based on chatting with their families and stuff like that. So it's it's a very interesting reality show, which has been quite the talk among my friends. And we have been doing a lot of Zoom and chatting and, you know, they are verifying information with me <laughs> because mine was in a way an arranged marriage as well. You're, so you are married? Yes, I'm married now, yes. And, it, and tell us how it was arranged. It was arranged in the sense that um, my parents are the ones who introduced me to her and I was in the US at that time. And uh, I had spoken to her for around seven to eight months over the phone. And uh, at that time, video calls wasn't a big thing, but uh, a lot of phone calls, lots of emails and stuff like that. And then I went back to India to meet her in person. And um, I met her and things clicked. And earlier the plan was we would get engaged and then I'll come back again because, you know, we don't get much vacation in the U.S. So I said, I'll come back again and get married. But I was in the process of getting my citizenship and green card and all of that. So I'm like, it'll be better if we got married right away because then you can jump the bandwagon. Otherwise, she would have to wait for five years to come here. So we got married in 10 days. <laughs> 10 days? After meeting her the first time, yeah. <laughs> so that that's my arranged marriage story. <laughs> And how long have you been married now? Uh, it's 2002, December, so. 18 years almost. 18, yeah. 18. Well done. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's, it feels like a very foreign concept to people, but uh, it's something, uh, I kind of see it as if a friend was introducing me to somebody, it would be kind of the same thing. This way, it kind of feels a little safer because my parents have done the background check on the families. They know who they are. And uh, her grandfather and my uncle were best friends in school. So that's how they kind of got chatting. And they are like, hey, I'm looking for somebody for my granddaughter. And he's like, oh, I have my nephew. And he's in the US. Would your daughter be interested to move into the US at some point? Or is that even something you know you all have considered? And they're like, yeah, let them chat. And yeah, so we had just conversations for six, eight months till we felt comfortable enough that, okay, this might be the person. And it was. So. Do you have children? No, we don't have kids. We have a dog, which is as big as, you know, any kid I can imagine. <laughs> it's just like the amount of uh, love and affection that we get from him is just amazing. He I is kind of like this glue between us, hangs out with us all the time, and he gives absolutely 50-50% attention to both of us. Wow. And if we are both in different rooms, if she's working in another room, I'm in this room, he will sit right in between. So he can keep looking at both of us. At <laughs> <laughs> I love him. Yeah. That's so he's cool. Desperate. Well, back to pottery. Yeah. So you mentioned that you were working for Intel for or in the industry for eleven years. So yeah. have you? Are you now a full time artist? Yes, I'm a full time artist. So in two thousand eleven is when I quit that job, and I kind of decided I wanted to do the pottery full time. And it was actually in the last five years of the job when you know the economy wasn't doing that well. Uh, that's when I actually started selling my work. So I kind of entered in the most weirdest point to sell artwork, but my work was very well received. I was getting accepted into some really nice fine art shows, uh, which were hard to get into. And I always had to take time off from work, which I somehow managed to, you know, have a schedule, but it was very exhausting. I was working in the mornings and then in the evenings I was working in my studio and um, it got really tough to manage the two. And plus a uh, gallery started asking for my work. They wanted to sell my work. And then they kind of said that, well, I said, I cannot handle, you know, wholesale and selling to galleries because I have a full-time job. And, but when I saw enough of a response coming from there, I was like, you know what, let's just see. And I, the work was, the work at Intel was getting really monotonous and because the economy wasn't doing great there was always that fear that 
oh, they could just lay you off tomorrow or something might happen. And I'm like, I would be much happier making the decision on my terms rather than one day just being like, okay, now I don't have a job and I have to figure out how to do this. So I'm like, right now I feel in a better position to do it. So let's do it now, try it out. And if it doesn't work, you know, I have my degrees with me. I have 11 years of experience. So I could get back into it if I wanted to. But now it's been eight years, nine years, eight, nine years since I quit. So it's fine. <laughs> I don't I have want to go back. <laughs> Yeah, I have a lot of questions about this actually. So a few things. One, you mentioned at the beginning that, well, at least what I heard you say is that because of your Indian culture, the expectation was to get a certain amount of education or go on a certain path. Am I getting that right? Yes. Yeah. And what I what I think is interesting is that your mother was in an artistic field, mm -hmm. but it sounds like you, because you were a male, you were were pushed to go into a not as artistic of a field, is that right? Yes, yes and no, but the kind of pressure uh, I think uh, Indian kids have in general is really focused on education. It doesn't matter what, whether you're a boy or a girl, you uh, put your education and studies at the highest priority. And when I was back in India growing up and, you know, studying in school, at that time, if you were anything less than a doctor or an engineer, means you basically are a really bad son or a bad daughter. You basically, that should be your only focus. Over the years, it's gotten better where they said, okay, if you have an MBA, that's good enough too. But <laughs> it, it like, they, that's, how, that's the kind of standards they held. Um, it was surprising because my dad is an engineer as well. And uh, he also landed up quitting his job and he went into uh, retail uh, business and later wholesale of ready-made clothing, you know, imports and selling those. And he had his shops and all of that, but he too always wanted to get his master's. So he kind of pushed that on me. So it was like, I didn't get a chance, but you can, but and, and when I did start working in the IT industry and I was a software programmer, I enjoyed that work. It was very challenging and interesting. And it is a very creative job as well. It's just, um, I wanted to do more with my hands than just type in stuff on a box. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, the other thing that's interesting is you referenced 2008, which was definitely uh, a moment in the economy. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then now we're here in this very unique time that most likely we won't see again in our lifetime, just based on you know the last pandemic being in the early 1900s. Right. So many people are out of work, or mm -hmm. if they aren't out of work, they're having these moments of reflection, you know, forced reflection, like yeah. where am I? What am I doing? How am I spending my life? And right. so, what would you say to people who? I mean, this is kind of an opportunity for some people, forced opportunity yeah. or maybe voluntary opportunity to yeah. do that thing that they've always wanted to do. Like, what would you say to them? And I, I, and I think this applies not only to those people, to me as well and everyone, right, in the state that um, I would be like, if you have the time right now, try to do things that you can. I know the mental state kind of uh, prevents you from being very creative also, or maybe, it pushes you to be creative in a certain way, which you never thought possible. So make the most of whatever time you have right now. It's I myself, you know, I need to listen to myself more than anything else. But even I get caught up very much as to if I land up spending time on something new and, you know, some big sculptural pieces, which I've always wanted to work on and things like that, then you wonder that, well, but how long is this pandemic going to last? Are there going to be shows again? Can I go to a show and show my new work to people? Because this really needs to be touched and seen in person. And you keep questioning that, whether it's worth the time, and then you keep going back and forth, and then it hinders your creativity and all of that. So I, the policy which I keep reminding myself is that, you know, there is only so much time you have right now. It would suck if you you know fell sick and then you couldn't do anything 
so might as well make the most of what you have right now. And the I uh, recently read a book, uh, Big Magic. Have you heard that one? I've heard of it, uh, but I don't know what it's about. Uh, it, it's, I think every creative person should read that. It really talks about how you shouldn't delay your creative juices. Just let them flow, do what you want. Don't question it too much as to whether you can make money off of it. Don't question, because the creative uh, intuitions and stuff kind of stay with you for a while. If you don't put them into effect, they go find somebody else and they say, hey, will you help me implement what I want? And and that goes away and it almost, you know, you know people feel this thing that I have, um, I had this idea and somebody's already doing it, but they're like, I had the idea first, I just didn't do it. It's basically that creative idea which stuck with you for a while, you just kept overthinking about it and then it went to somebody else. Mm-hmm. So it's not yours anymore. So yeah. if you get some idea, you have the time right now, if you have the resources right now, just go ahead and do it. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> when I hear you say that, I think about this image of us as a vessel and mm-hmm. the idea moving through us. Yeah. And so we either sort of manifest it or like you were right. saying, it moves on to the next vessel. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's a natural process. It's like, uh, and the book talks about it really well, where it says that, okay, I hung around you for long enough. You kept thinking about me, but you kept questioning whether it's the right thing. That idea really needs to come to life. So it just find somebody else. And it does, it's gone through you. It's gone through your system. You just didn't do anything about it. So if you get an idea, and especially if you have the time and resources, that's become another issue, right, with people. It's like uh, resources, getting stuff easily. You can't just walk into a craft show and get the supplies you needed or things like that. So you kind of have to figure out, some people are getting really creative with what you already have at home. I have gone through some uh, old clothing that was going to go through Goodwill and I've cut it up and I'm planning on using it for some weaving projects. And it's just like, why just you know let it go when um, you're getting rid of them just to make room or something? If you can reuse them, recycle them yourself, why not? Get why not? Why not? So why do knitters and crocheters and fiber artists love pottery? Like talk about when they come into your booth at these festivals and they go crazy for what you've made, because I don't know if you have any examples there. You can send me some photos, but yeah. some of your items seem to have even like knitted etchings in them. Yes. And that is what relates to them. I have one of my mugs which I'm drinking from, so I'd be careful not to spill. But yeah, they have their knit structures and buttons, which remind them of their favorite sweaters. Uh, that is one thing that does appeal to uh, people who walk into my booth especially and I what I like to bring to my work is the textural quality of knitwear and fabric uh, whether it's embroidery pieces woven pieces cables and lace work uh, I don't want just an impression like uh, you know knitters crocheters all fiber artists we love to sit in one place with our craft and do what we love doing and we like to have a nice big mug of coffee or tea next to us. That's the one reason why they like pottery. I think why they relate more to my work is because of the surface decoration is so much about their craft. It doesn't, uh, it's not written on it saying, hey, I'm a knitter and I love to knit or anything. It's just very naturally, it's a knitter's mug. And uh, so, you know, I have like lace, pieces that I do and you know they have a lot of detail and um, and all of these are hand carved in the negative on my master slabs and then I make impressions out of them so that they actually look like three-dimensional lace that has been stuck on the piece so it has that textural quality which is a good way to start your morning you know you can't get to your knitting right away but hey if you're a busy person who has to get to work you can at least have your first morning cup of coffee in this knitted mug. Uh, Plus, if you have your mug at work, everyone knows it's your mug because you're the only knitter there and nobody will mess with that. 
uh, I have heard from yarn shop owners who have carried my work that during the holidays, it's like husbands when they walk in, they are always confused as to, I don't know what yarn my wife would like or my girlfriend would like, but they see a knitted mug and they're like, oh, I know she liked that. So, so it's things like that, that it's not necessarily knitters, but people can relate to the uh, surface decoration and the construction. Like I have seams on my mouse, like sweaters do. So all those kinds of details relate very much to fiber artists. I, that's what I see. How did you become a fiber artist? What was your journey to the fiber? Oh, journey to fiber, actually. So I started with the clay and I was doing a lot of fine art shows. And like I mentioned, I quit my full-time job, moved into this full-time. And um, at that time, I, most of my work was inspired by Indian embroidery pieces. So because it was an influence from my mom's shop and the colors I saw, Bollywood movies, Indian weddings, that's all what my mind was about. And um, I have like some one piece out here, like this is the kind of embroidery pieces that I did. So these are vases which hold flowers or needles. At the fine art shows, they hold flowers, but at fiber shows, they hold knitting needles. That's what they do. But uh, wait, before and, you go on, wait, before you go on, I know okay. you mentioned bridezillas, but please yeah. tell me uh -huh. about your wedding. Did you go full Bollywood? Yes, we did. Yes. Yes, we did. And even in 10 days, uh, this is another funny thing, actually. We had 350 people at our wedding. <gasps> and people out here, whenever I tell that, like the shock on your face is like, Damn, that's so many people within 10 days. People came to our wedding and said that, why, why are there such few people at this wedding? No. <laughs> like, because in Indian standards, you need at least a thousand people to make it look like a wedding. <laughs> 350, 400 people is like, oh, nobody showed up because it was middle of the week. It was planned, you know, within 10 days. Yeah. Uh, we didn't have time to, give, uh, to even send out invitation cards yeah. because that's a big deal in India as well. Mm -hmm. We just made phone calls. Yeah. And, and did you have multiple costume changes? Uh, our wedding was, uh, we didn't do the traditional five day thing, which, you know, my brother's wedding was kind of like that because it was planned over a year and exhausted. Mm -hmm. But uh, we had our wedding within two days, but we had three, three different occasions. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was one separate occasion, which my wife had with just her side of the family. Mm -hmm. so that like, was a pre, a like a pre-event? Yeah, like a pre-event. Uh, it's just kind of to get blessings from the elders and things like that. Beautiful. And uh, But yeah, we had our costume changes. So every wedding was a different thing. And like different clothing, uh, different people. But I'm so amazed. Like within 10 days, everyone arranged for everything they needed. To yeah. Get everything together. And like my mom's side of the business, being into making bride bridal clothes and all uh my wife couldn't find anything like you know just to go get from our shop or even her side of the family is very much into the fiber field mm -hmm. but uh it was like no she can't find anything so she actually went to a very well-known designer and got a wedding dress from there and she spent you know much more than anyone else but she's like I can't find anything I like this is what I like we have just 10 days there's no more time left <laughs> and <laughs> like this is what I'm getting Love and it. Uh, so it was it was fun to do that and then plus with Indian weddings you know everyone wears a different color and different costume and everything so even when my mom used to design clothes for brides and bridesmaids back then she had to be sure everyone was wearing every sister was wearing something different, but she couldn't share with the other one what the other one was wearing. Oh, so it's a secret? It had to be a big grand surprise at the wedding that, oh, wow, you look amazing. What are you wearing? Kind of thing. I love that. So yeah, what so colors did you guys, sense. what colors did you guys wear? Do you, do you remember? Um, ours was more orange. Hers was more orangish red. That's why I said, this my color is orange red. <laughs> so... <laughs> So yeah, so uh, that's what she wore. Uh, I wore like an off-white uh, 
suit kind of thing and it had orange red embroidery all over it so yeah. you had embroidery on your wedding outfit yes love that yes we uh, without embroidery especially if you're the groom or bride or whatever no you just can't cut it <laughs> yeah it's got to be you got to be next level yeah yeah it have to be a little flashy yeah the yeah. brother's so, wedding i remember was his costume was so heavy that like we couldn't even carry it in one bag <laughs> it was just ridiculous so, he had rhinestones and stuff on it too much so the embroidery the actual you know i love how you're calling it that because that's what it is but you know this thread and fabric which is embroidery yeah. influenced you into the fiber arts so how did it go to knitting or spinning or crocheting how has it led you down that path yeah so like i was saying i was at the fine art shows doing mostly my embroidery work and uh, a lot of the fiber and fabric people were getting drawn to my booth and occasionally i used to talk to them about what so there were quilters there were knitters and all kinds of people who used to enjoy my embroidered pieces because you know to remind them of clothing and fabric uh it uh, and i had quit my job and i think i was 3 or 4 years into it doing full time and my feet were killing me because i was standing up and uh, one of my and i was talking to a customer at a show and i said i cannot you know take my clay and sit in front of the television and do something because it's messy i need to be in my studio and she suggested that i should take up knitting and she's like you can do it while you watch television and i was so clueless i was like oh isn't knitting like making knots and she's like no it's not just look up something on youtube and you will know what it is i'm like fine and i remember coming back uh, from the show i just had some jute twine at home and i had chopsticks and i knitted myself a square in garter stitch and i was like oh this is fun <laughs> it was i was just amazed that this was for the first time i made a piece of fabric for the very first time uh, from scratch almost and then i spoke to a friend of mine that hey i'm trying out knitting and she is like oh so you had needles and all I said no. I just used chopsticks. They were fun. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, "Okay, stop being extra creative. Come over. I'll give you some yarn and needles, and you can make something." And uh, so I got my first ball of acrylic yarn and size eight needles, and I knit my niece a scarf from it. And uh, after that, it's just been a big downward, uh, downward, upward. I don't know. Whatever spiral. let's just call it as been a big spiral yeah you're in the tornado of fiber exactly and uh, it so yeah it was a lot uh, so it all started with the knitting and uh, lots of knitting then the yarn shops then visiting fiber festivals and the very first uh, knitting show that i attended uh, was here in washington and uh, i was walking in the aisles and i was bumping into customers from my fine art shows. Oh. And they were like, what are you doing here? Do you have a booth here? I said, no, I'm shopping for yarn just like you are. And they're like, oh, you knit too? I said, yeah, I just started like two months back and I found out about the shows. I'm here to buy more yarn. And they all kept saying, you need to have a booth here and you need to have a booth here. So, and I kind of liked that feeling that I was already accepted in this show fiber show scenario which i had not even considered doing before because i always saw myself as you know being in the fine art shows and um, and bumping into so many customers of mine at that show plus it didn't have the husband telling them not to buy anything so that was amazing <laughs> 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 i was like okay i definitely need to do these shows yeah well you didn't realize yet the whole mug knitting thing i mean you no, I just know. graduated from chopsticks so you yeah. weren't there yet i wasn't there yet and at that time uh, my patterns still just had the embroidery patterns they didn't have the knit patterns on them and uh, it that's when it kind of dawned on me that well if i do need to get into any kind of fiber show i maybe need to relate more to knitters and plus this is the first time i was making 
my own fabric and I was really liking the texture of the knit patterns and all of that. Like what I was exposed to earlier was mostly embroidery. So that's what appealed to me. And this time it was knit patterns. I'm like, okay, let's just do a plain stock in it and figure out how to do that in clay. And so I, it wasn't a very conscious decision that, oh, I want to do a fiber festival. So I need to have a knit pattern on it. And that's what I wanted to do. For me, it was more like trying out, can I actually do this? Because I, you know, the first impression people have is I take a knitted piece of fabric and stick it onto the clay. And that really doesn't make any impression. It doesn't get the crisp definition I need. So it really involves a lot of work where I hand carve with the negative, push the clay in and get the texture and make my pieces. So the very first pieces I have some here are these small little dishes I have made. So these were the very first knit related pieces I made. And uh, so yeah, I have all these different glazes, but they were very simple round dishes. And uh, the first show I showed them at, um, they just sold out within an hour. Then I posted on, I went to a men's knitting retreat and there I bumped into Franklin Habit and he saw my work. And he was amazed and he posted on his Instagram or whatever. And my shop was empty within seconds. And uh, it just kind of got out from there. And I, I had no idea about how fiber people shop. So, <laughs> How do we shop? How do we shop? Uh, kind of like how I do now. I just need to know that there is something out there and I have to have it and I buy it right away. I, there, is, it, it, there is a lot of passionate shopping, which I like about it. It's like they know what they like and if they want it, they get it. There is, um, because we know that if these items are handmade, there is a limited amount of it, or yes, I can keep making more of it, but I'm not a machine. I can't make it endlessly. Plus, I've seen the biggest advantage. I don't have to explain to fiber artists that, oh, these are handmade, these take time, blah, blah, blah. They know how much time it takes to make anything by hand. They are knitters, they are crocheters. They know they spend six months on a sweater. And so to them, uh, showing them the value of your work that it's handmade and I don't have to justify price. I don't have to justify any of those things, which used to happen at some other shows I did earlier. But at the fiber shows, they just know that what is quality work, how much effort has gone into it. And there is so much more relatability because I'm a fiber artist too. Uh, most of the time, we are just talking knitting patterns at a fiber show, and I forget that I'm there to sell my pottery. But. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like we are educated, relatable, and passionate. Yes. Yeah. It definitely. Talk, talk about that gorgeous wheel behind you. I'm seeing a oh, car so, wheel. There it is. Yes. That's yeah. my spinning wheel. That's my uh, Lendrum spinning wheel. And um, I have uh, decorated it. It's actually a very plain looking wheel. Oh. But of course, I had to make it look pretty. I don't know. It's not in focus. Should I bring it closer? You don't need to. It, did you paint it then? Yeah, so it's all uh, painted very much like my embroidery patterns on my pottery. That's how I painted that one. And uh, so a few years after knitting, that's when the spinning and the weaving and the other rabbit hole started. But uh, all those back there are my hand spun art yarns hanging back there. And uh, yeah, I, I love to spin and make my own yarn now. So. If you look on your Instagram, you can see that you use, I mean, I'm sure it's inspiration from other places, but many of the photos that you use as inspiration, they look to be from India. Yes, there are, there are a lot of uh, Indian influences still in my work because, you know, we, like I moved to the U.S. in 98 for doing my master's and, you know, been here for a very long time. But uh, essentially, we do surround ourselves with everything Indian. We still love watching our Indian movies. We love our Indian food. Uh, we love our Indian clothing. 
um, it's kind of really hard to extract all of that from us. And and why do it, right? It's right. Uh, this is what I like. Like I remember when I started doing uh, the shows out here uh, in Washington, uh, people were really amazed because my most popular um, color that I sold was red and honey in pottery. And people at that time were only familiar with green, blue, and brown. <laughs> These are the three colors in pottery which everyone had. Like it was known that traditional stoneware pottery comes in this color. And mine was stoneware too. And they are like, but yours is all colorful. And I don't know if you've seen any pictures of my booth with all the colors. And it's like, it looked like an Indian wedding. Like everyone, every part of mine dressed in different clothing, different colors, different patterns, different textures. And I said, that's what I really wanted to create. And that's all the Indian influence. So I didn't want to change that. It kind of represents who I am. Of course. And I've always made the kind of things that have interested me. And that's why, you know, the knit patterns appeared in my work. Then when I got into more complex knitting and started doing lace work, then the lace work appeared in my work. And when I started uh, spinning my own yarn, uh, I had mugs in hand spun yarn patterns and I've been working now towards making a lot of art yarns and figuring out how to include them into my pottery. And so there is all this influence on basically what appeals to me in the fiber world kind of enters into the ceramic world. I'm just going to pop up a picture here. This has, it looks like a beautiful, perhaps an Indian door. Uh, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. And this art bat that you made is right next to it in the, like the split screen. And you can see right. the influence of the door with the art bat. Yes. And uh, that's what I think I have one, the bat sitting back there. Uh, but it's, uh, I, I recently, so this is one of those things as to what do you do when a pandemic is going on, right? <laughs> uh, I so badly wanted a drum carter in order to make art bats so I could spin from them. Uh, I've enjoyed spinning art bats from other artists, but there were always this, you know, you have this picture in your mind or you have it in your Pinterest page and you're going like, I really want to make that in an art bat. And uh, which meant that I needed to get uh, a drum carder. So that was like a lot of going back and forth, discussing with friends. Do I really need one? There were friends who were willing to lend me the hours to they're like here borrow mine and you can make mine and i did borrow one for a week or so i said no i just have to have my own yeah <laughs> i just need to shell out the money and do this and it makes a very hard decision because you know you're not at the shows right now you're not uh, doing the kind of uh, income which you would be doing at shows or wholesale and selling at yarn shops uh, that's not happening too much. Trunk shows are a thing of the past almost mm -hmm. right now. And uh, so making that decision that, okay, I need to invest in this is is sometimes okay because I really, I know it's made me so much happier at this time making these art bats because I've been able to express what I wanted to do with color and texture. Plus this involved me buying a lot of wool and silk learning how to dye the different fibers. So I'm dyeing them. It's like, it gave me something to learn, educate myself with, which I really enjoy doing. I, I like I, I like to be studying something. If, if I'm not learning anything new in what I'm doing, I find it really boring and monotonous. So, so it, it gave me an opportunity to learn and then figure out how to make the art bats. And uh, yeah, I've been making them, finding pictures that inspire me, full of color, saturation, texture, and and yeah. So that's what I've been working on now and just playing with it for now. I just have a few more questions for you. Uh, yeah. Number one, can we purchase things from you online? Yes, uh, I have my website, uh, creativewithclay.com, and I have been very good during this pandemic time where I have been updating it with stuff I have on stock. And if you don't see stuff on stock, there is a link as to how you can go for me to order. And because the knit mugs, 
usually just fly off very quickly. Uh, that is usually even currently they are out of stock, but if you, there's a link how you can place a made to order uh, thing too. So that, that can be placed. And every time I do a kiln unloading, I usually go live while I do that. And uh, so many people end up picking their mugs while the live is going on, or they will go ahead and you know, purchase it from the website. But whatever is left, I just quickly update it on the website as well. So it's all available on creativewithclay.com. Does your wife do anything with the fiber arts? Uh, not really. She wears them. <laughs> she is gets she a good? sweater. Uh, she's gotten a sweater almost every year for the past three three years, three, four years. And so I'm, I knit usually two sweaters every year, one for myself, one for her. And her initial sweaters were done on the knitting machine because I love machine knitting as well. Mm -hmm. And because she's so picky on size, I was like, okay, the first sweaters you get machine knit so I can figure out what sizing and what style you like. And then I started hand knitting for her as well. But I hand knit all my sweaters. Is she a good yarn wife? Yes. She, she's very supportive. She understands why I need to do this. Uh, though initially when I started with this hobby as such, uh, she was quite surprised as to the way I was spending on yarn because mm. all my previous hobbies, whether it was clay or painting or whatever, they didn't cost so much. <laughs> and uh, every time I went to a fiber festival or a yarn shop and I came back and then I would tell them, hey, I got a sweater's quantity and it you know, it was $200 or something. She's like, I could get a pretty nice, well-designed sweater from the mall for a lot less than that. And every time I touch that, you go like, it's too expensive, but you were going to buy yarn worth $200 to me. She's like, I don't get the math. <laughs> there is a learning curve to it. There is a learning curve to it. So she was always surprised with that. And, and because I had not spend like that on any previous hobby of mine mm -hmm. she's like wow this is really expensive <laughs> like, <laughs> yes it is but and and it is it was very clear right when i started that i had like pottery was my hobby when i was doing my it job and once that became full time you know the the fiber arts kind of became my hobby Mm -hmm. And again, one influences the other. I kind of need something to be learning and doing. So, Those watching are going to want to know, what is that item on your left? Which item? This it's one? hanging up. Yeah? Yes. Yes, that's my uh, blanket. This is the very first pattern, my first and only pattern. No, I have another pattern up, but this has been my most popular pattern that I wrote up. It's on Ravelry, but it's my uh, seashell scrap yarn blanket. And it's all made with scraps of sock yarn. And the way I had designed this was to actually use every scrap of yarn and no yarn in this is more than five yards long. So wow. the pattern talks about taking all your scraps separating light and dark colors, cutting up your scraps to five yard lengths and making your yarn before you even start knitting. And oh, so you don't have to weave in any ends. No, you don't. It's all done with short rows. So you actually make, a, you make two balls of dark colored yarn and two of light colored yarn. You hold your two dark colors together and you knit your row of dark colored shells. So it kind of marls and does magic. And then the next row is of the light colored shells, which alternates in between. So the color offsets and you don't have to plan the color when you're knitting it. And because every yarn length is only five yards long, it'll make, it'll go in one shell and the next shell a little bit. And every shell ends up being a different color. So while you're knitting it, it's just exciting to see which the next one will be. And because you're alternating the light and dark, the you don't have to think about the values, whether they'll work or not while you're knitting. It's already been planned previously. That is Plus cool. I do suggest you employ your family to teach them how to do the magic knot so they can make the yarn for you. So you don't have to do that. Totally. 
Love yeah. that. Well, I have so enjoyed our time chatting today. Oh, this was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it too. I really appreciate it. I hope we can do it again sometime and I hope we can meet uh, for real one day. That would be really, really special. Yes, that would be fun. And I will link underneath this video to that pattern and also to your website yes. because I'm sure people are going to want to connect with you after seeing this chat today. Yes, definitely. And I'm very active on Instagram as well. Uh, my Instagram feed does confuse people whether I'm more of a fiber artist or a porter, but it, that's day to day what's happening in my life. I love so, that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much and we'll say goodbye. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. Bye. <laughs>